On November 24, 1940, an order arrived from the central office of the German security forces directing the Nazi district governors of occupied Poland to prohibit the granting of exit visas to all Orthodox Jews from Eastern Europe, and specifically rabbis. The spiritual continuation of the Jewish people, should they reach the United States or other places throughout the world, stated the order, must be prevented. Against this background, an heroic episode was about to be played out by a little-known Dutch council in Lithuania named Jan Zwartendijk, who later came to be known as the Angel of Mercy. In September of 1939, the German army overran western Poland while the Soviets occupied the eastern half. In fear for their lives, more than 10,000 Polish Jewish refugees fled to Lithuania, at the time a neutral country. Among these refugees were thousands of Talmudic scholars, rabbis, and the intellectual elite of Poland's Jews. Then, in July of 1940, Lithuania was annexed by the Soviets, while the Holocaust loomed over Europe's Jews. Fearing the future, a Dutch yeshiva student, Nathan Gutworth, approached the acting council in Kovno, Lithuania, Jan Zwartendijk, and requested assistance in going to the Dutch island of Curaçao. The very appointment of Zwartendijk, an executive for the Philips Company, proved a coincidence, and occurred only after the Dutch ambassador had removed the previous council from office, when it was learned that his wife was a Nazi sympathizer. When Zwartendijk contacted the Dutch ambassador in Riga, he learned that no visa was necessary for travel to Curaçao. But a rarely granted entry visa from the island's governor was. Jan Zwartendijk, son of the council, recalls. Well, what my father did in Lithuania was simply say that you didn't need a visa for Curaçao, but that was only half the story. They had nothing to say about entry into Curaçao in Lithuania. Uh, the other half was that you couldn't get into Curaçao unless you had a landing permit of the local governor. My father would leave that out. And then, of course, it sounded as if you didn't need a visa for Curaçao, so you could go. Armed with an official-looking passport stamp, an apparent Curaçao N visa, written in French, the diplomatic language, the refugees were now able to obtain the critical transit visa which would permit them to leave Russia. This 10-day transit visa was issued by, of all people, the Japanese consul Sugihara. Within hours, word of the Curaçao visas spread throughout Vilna's Jews. I was 11 years old. I remember going to my father's office after school to get a ride home. And there was a mob of people out there, all trying to get up the stairs at the same time. There was a, a separate entrance to his office upstairs in his firm, Phillips and people were standing there in line and it was useless to get a ride from my father because he didn't go home until late at night and went back early in the morning. At grave personal danger from both the Nazis, who now occupied Holland, where he was soon to return, and from the Soviets, Jan Zwartendijk worked tirelessly writing visas for 10 crucial days. He started about July the 24th and ended uh, somewhere on August the 1st or August the 2nd. And according to his own estimate, thought he had written 12 or 1400. We now find from survivors that he actually wrote more than 2100. He, he thought, he thought it, was a, it was a slim chance, but it was the only chance. And, and that it, it was the decent thing to do to, to work on it. He was a very decent man. Uh, who simply saw people in terrible trouble and, and helped them. There was nothing, uh, he, he had nothing to gain by doing it. But if, if the Gestapo had found out about this, uh, I still don't know why they didn't. Uh, it would have been, been pretty rough for him. In all, about 2,200 Jewish souls were saved from certain death due to the heroic efforts of Jan Zwartendijk, a man who simply did what he thought right. Over 250 students and teachers of the Mir Yeshiva were saved, the only yeshiva to survive the Holocaust intact. Among the survivors were the Torah scholars who brought Jewish values to the Western world and rekindled a renaissance of Jewish learning throughout the world. Also saved was Rabbi Zelig Epstein, who later became the teacher of Boys Town's Rosh Yeshiva, 
and Dean Moshe Lindner. Today in Jerusalem, Jan Schwartendijk's ethic of caring about others and doing the right thing is perpetuated at Boys Town through the teaching of the timeless values of our sacred heritage. Here, amid the ancient hills of Judah, stand monuments to Israel's past and Israel's future. Surrounded by the very ground on which the foundations of the Jewish people were laid, is yet another miracle in Jerusalem. A place where young boys with troubled and often tormented pasts are nourished and blossom into young men with limitless futures. This is Boys Town, Jerusalem. Founded in 1949 by Rabbi Alexander Lynchner and Ira Gilden as an educational and spiritual haven for Jewish boys who were survivors of Europe's death camps and for refugees of Arab oppression. Boys Town today stands proud on its magnificent 18-acre campus. Here, boys from over 50 countries throughout the world learn moral and ethical values and a sense of social responsibility. This, combined with a religious and academic education, gives special meaning to the words Torah and technology. As Israel's needs have changed, so too has Boys Town's approach to technical education. The new comprehensive interdisciplinary technology allows each boy to realize his full potential by providing an opportunity to work with many different scientific disciplines. Boys Town's comprehensive interdisciplinary technology is recognized internationally as a trend-setting example of education. The role of the computer is central to the boys' education. Boys Town students learn basic and advanced computer science. New immigrants use it as a tool to learn Hebrew. Student life at Boys Town is more than classrooms. For over a thousand students, Boys Town provides comfortable dormitories. For many students, these bi-level rooms are a far cry from their former impoverished surroundings. Over 5,000 meals a day are served to students and staff in beautiful and spacious dining rooms. Here, boys from a myriad of cultural backgrounds join the Boys Town melting pot to exchange ideas and enjoy the home cooking. Recreation plays an important role in student life. And free time is often spent in one of the many Boys Town athletic facilities. Part of our philosophy at our school is that in addition to the education that the students receive, it's very, very important to inculcate the values of helping, of caring for others, of giving of oneself to others, and not just receiving like students mostly receive. It's, it's part of their responsibility, and the responsibility of being a Jew, to help others. We also send students before Pesach to clean in people, in elderly people's homes so they can't help themselves and fix things, repair things in people who have limited means. Our students know how to work with their hands, carpentry, electrical work, uh, basic even plumbing, fixing closets, fixing doors, all kinds of work where the boys are able to make use of their talents. At first glance, these boys look like ordinary kids doing ordinary things. But there is nothing ordinary about them. For they come from a region just north of Gaza called Gush Katif, an ancient Jewish area now besieged by daily rains of terror. Life has become nights in bunkers, going to school in armored vehicles, seeing loved ones attacked and murdered. In the summer of 2001, Boys Town established Camp Shalom, a recreational program to provide a respite for over 200 of Gush Katif's children. Boys Town students served as counselors, accompanying campers on field trips, providing entertainment, and nurturing their war-wearied spirits. While this mime may master the imaginary, there is nothing imaginary about the bomb shelters these boys call home. In yet another expression of Boys Town's commitment to instill the values of helping others, Students also participate in a summer camp hosted by the school for kids with terminal illness. Most recently, Boys Town was designated by the Cisco Corporation as the first regional academy for teaching Cisco's networking management program. The school was selected because of its state-of-the-art computer center and academic excellence. In May of 1996, a ceremony was held at Boys Town, Jerusalem to establish the Jan Schwartendijk Faculty of Humanitarian Ethics and Values. 
Attending was Jan Schwartendijk's children, Edith, Jan, and Robert. And so now, I would like to call members of the Zwartendick family, Dr. Jan Zwartendick, Mr. Robert Zwartendick, and this is Edith, yes. Jan Zwartendijk, Angel of Mercy. Kiryat Noah Yushalai, Boystown, Jerusalem. In August 1940, Jan Zwartendijk, as Dutch Council in Kovno, issued visas which saved the lives of 2,200 Torah scholars who rekindled the eternal flame of Torah throughout the world. In honor of his heroic humanitarian efforts, a grateful Jewish people has established a permanent scholarship fund at Boystown, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Mir HaKodesh, Hafzayin, Iyar Tashnav. They are the immigrants from Russia and Ethiopia. They are the refugees fleeing from Middle Eastern countries who to this day oppress Jews. They are the survivors of broken homes and emotional torment. They are the students of Boystown, Jerusalem. And it is they who are our future. But Boys Town's mission is far more than producing scientists, doctors, military leaders, and professionals. At its very core, its heart, is the reclamation of the human spirit through the values developed and nurtured here. And it is these values, this vision, this sense of social responsibility, which will ultimately leave its mark on the history of the Jewish people and strengthen the state of Israel.